Good morning, everyone. We're continuing with our Ananda Way of Life series based on guidelines of conduct for members of the Ananda Sevaka Order. And I now have memorized it after 12 weeks or whatever it is, and I can say it without looking at the cover. Okay, let's say a prayer to start. Heavenly Father, Divine Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Jesus Christ, Babaji Krishna, Lahiri Mahashaya, Swami Sri Yukteswar, Beloved Master, Paramahansa Yogananda, Saints of all religions, Dear friend Swami Kriyananda, humbly we bow to you all. Help us to be your instruments in this world. Above all, help us to love others as you love us, to be as unconditional in our friendship as you are with all of us. Help us to be in tune with your flow of energy, that everything we do will bring us into deeper attunement with thy eternal bliss. Om. Peace. Amen. (coughs) All right, my friends, we are in the section about personal possessions. Right now we're talking about money. Tomorrow we'll talk about home building, property in general. This is just a very practical section of this uh, of, of these guidelines because how we regard the things of the material world are a concrete recognizable expression of who we think of ourselves internally how we relate to higher realities oftentimes people want to just kind of dismiss this whole material world as not being relevant. And admittedly, it's a big nuisance. There's no question about it. But we have to work with it appropriately. Yesterday, I believe, I mentioned the fact that um, Swami said to me at a certain point that you don't get out of karma by doing it badly. What he meant by that is you have to face into it, you have to accept it, you have to act through it, Um, from a divine perspective, but on the level of reality on which it exists. In that context, I talked about the period of time in my life when I was involved in building a small house at Ananda. And now having a possession of that magnitude felt like a threat to my spiritual dedication, but it was a profound misunderstanding because God is equally present everywhere, and every aspect of life can and must be spiritualized. We can't just cut it off and say, it's not part of God, because it is. So we're in the middle of the section about money earned, and about how Swamiji felt it was important. He doesn't elaborate here, but he elaborates in later writings, how important he felt it was for an individual to learn to be responsible for himself, and to work properly with the magnetism required um, for self-sufficiency. By no means did Swami encourage an over-involvement with money, but we have to be appropriate within the context. And as Sri Yukteswar put it perfectly, we need to learn to be comfortable within our purse, which is to say to adjust our desires to our resources and not live in a dream world that way. So all of that requires a certain amount of personal involvement in financial matters, which is how Swami set the community up. So he writes, um, Members have a right to keep for themselves any income they earn or any money they receive from sources outside the community, save only such fees that all owe for the community's maintenance and improvement for the support of the schools, etc., so again, we have a very conventional and onto system. People pay, you know, what is the equivalent of rent, but it's not exactly because of the way it's structured. It's, so it's more like community fees and um, school fees and so on. There was a, per- a point in time in, at which, in which the parents 
those who had children, expressed distress to Swamiji because the entire support of the school was on those who had children. And Swamiji listened to them seriously, and then we had several community meetings about it, and we all came to the conclusion that education for life, and therefore the schools that we were running, um, were a fundamental part of Master's mission, and that if we were going to say that the children um, belong to the whole community in the sense of extended family, then why would single people not also contribute to the development of the schools? And so it, it, we expanded the school fee system to have it be part of the, the expense for anyone who lives um, in one of our communities. In the, in, actually, it's only a Nanda village because the situation there is unique. In Palo Alto, we have a school, but it's a private school where a tuition-based private school, and it's not a community school in the way the Ananda Village School is. All that is extraordinary, detailed and unrelated, but I got myself into it, so I had to explain it. <laughs> Members should take, take it then, not as a requirement of mem membership, but as natural to the spirit of cooperation and sharing to contribute a portion of their prosperity to the welfare of all. For example, all members are expected, though not required, to tithe from their income in addition to their monthly fees as their divine contribution to the overall prosperity and development of their spiritual home and family. Well, Swami brings up tithing there in the subject of money, so this is a good opportunity, and I, I take every opportunity I can to talk about tithing when I can. Um, Tithing is a, is a practice that is, was in place in the Jewish society that Jesus was born into. Some people think that tithing was something that Jesus um, created, but he did not. He merely confirmed a practice that literally goes back to Moses, goes all the way back to the burning bush. It wasn't one of the Ten Commandments, but it was part of the Mosaic Law and the way it's described um, in that in the Bible in that period of time, is that the the, uh, the shepherd uh, will the, the the temple official or the or, or someone holds holds a staff, and the shepherd passes his flock one one sheep at a time through the staff, and every tenth sheep is taken out and given for the for the support of the priest and the temple, and so it's just one out of ten is where tithe means, tithe means a tenth. Now, the, the concept of it is, is very practical, although it has a, a powerful dimension that is outside of the material realm. But it's very simple that the, 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 the spiritual energy that is generated in a community I'm not talking just about intentional Ananda communities, but in the broadest sense, the spiritual energy that is generated from having a vibrant spiritual center, whether that is dedicated priests, um, uh, religious education, uh, a place of worship, a shrine, um, regular ceremonies, just everything that you can think of that might be associated with how you keep spiritual life vibrant. If you have a vibrant spiritual center that everybody in the community can participate and draw from, um, then it greatly enhances the harmony, the success, the happiness, the um, fulfillment on higher levels of everybody involved. And the way the material world is constructed, and Master put it perfectly when he put it this way, Every good, noble, or philanthropic enterprise sooner or later comes down to a matter of money, which is not a cynical statement at all. It's just a simple statement of fact. The priest has to, has to eat, has to have a roof over his head. If we want a gathering place, we need some kind of a structure to do it. The roof will leak and it will need to be repaired. Um, ceremonies often require... Um, special implements or 
uh, food for the gods and goddesses or food for the community to celebrate. It's, it all comes down to somehow it has to be supported on the material plane. The obvious people to support it are those who draw energy from it. The obvious reason to support it is it's an investment in the welfare of everyone. Just as an individual will establish a home for himself, for his spouse, for his children, um, will take care of his land and his animals, um, his crops, whatever he needs to take care of because he thinks of it as mine and therefore I am responsible for it and I want it to be fruitful and beneficial because I need that for all the people that I love. So what, what the principle of tithing is trying to expand is to say, well, this is my temple. This is my religious center. This is my spiritual home. And I am as much responsible for it as I am for the bed that I sleep in in the room where my children stay. Where, where does the line come? then I'm not responsible for it. So it's, it's expanding that sense of I and mine in a profound spiritual direction. Now, why the tithe, the tenth, I don't know. That's how it, it starts with Moses and was confirmed by Jesus that one-tenth is a, a certain magic number. Now, I sort of can feel a little bit why it is, and I'm going to come in a minute that it's you can make a bargain with God if one-tenth feels like too much. The quality of tithing, however, is different than donating. I mean, just thinking of the ten sheep walking under the staff and the tenth one being given to the temple, it's not, I have extra money and I want to spend it. It's that this is a, a uh, that, that one-tenth of everything I have is not mine because what, what gives me the power even to have 10 sheep or $1 or 10,000 or 10 million? Where does the power even to acquire and to be successful or even to be marginal, but nonetheless, you know, to have any resources at all, where does that power come from? Upon whom do I rely for everything? Is it all just me and my egoic power? Or do I acknowledge you know, every day, every hour, every minute, if I can be that conscious, that everything is a gift from God? And how do I express my gratitude? So tithing is an expression of gratitude, or even another way of thinking about it, is only, only 90% of what is given to me is mine at all. One-tenth of it simply belongs to God. And I, it's not that even that I'm giving it, I'm returning it. Because the power to acquire comes from Him. And this is my, I think of it as a commission. It's the, it's the finder's fee that we, we pass over, one-tenth of it. And when I lived in a simpler way, and I didn't have as complicated as the life as I have now, but... When I was traveling, this would be in the early 80s, and my work was actually to... I lived at Ananda Village in that little house that I talked about building. But my actual work was that I would spend weeks on the road, going to uh, mostly up into the Northwest, spending several weeks giving classes. And people would... I would earn money doing that. People were often generous to me. And I literally... I kept two envelopes in my purse. And... Any money that came to me, I immediately divided. And always one-tenth of it went into God's envelope. And the concept of tithing is not that I'm giving this money to build a new building, I'm giving this money to pay for a new golden um, morty or something like that. It's This is God's money, and I give it back without any qualification. I don't have any direction over that money. It's not a choice. I give it back to the source of my inspiration. We don't even think I'm giving it to the church or to the priest. I'm giving it to the source of my inspiration. You know, the, the visible manifested source. Many people tithe directly to Swami Kriyananda because they loved Ananda, they, they loved the community they lived in. But when they asked themselves, what is the source of my inspiration? They felt it to be very personal to Swami and they would just 10% of whatever came in, they would give it to Swamiji, and then he would just use it as he cared to use it. 
Um, we all started tithing, it was like in the late 70s when this idea first entered into Ananda. And a lot of Ananda's prosperity from that whole period of time, tithing was an integral part of, of sort of shifting um, the whole economy of Ananda more into a flow of energy rather than a, a sense of money being a limited resource that we always had to hoard. Because, see, part of what happens when you have to give away 10% is that you have to think about it on a constant basis. And it's very interesting because people who have very limited resources feel that, that they can hardly spare the 10%, even though it might be 10 cents on a dollar or a dollar on a $10 bill. But there's this, this sense of lack, so I'm worried about it. People who have a great deal of money who have to give 10%, it's a very large check. And so their response would be, ooh, this is an awful lot of money. Not that I'm going to lack, but just that the check is so big. One, one uh, couple who started the tithing practice, who eventually, uh, through work that he did, um, became very successful, they said the first tithing check that they wrote was for $50. And then one of the later tithing checks they wrote was for $1 million. But all the way through, they just took 10% of whatever it was. And it was the same reality every time. It was 90% is mine and 10% belongs to God. There's a prosperity teacher in Australia who used to say, if you don't feel a little nervous when you write your tithing check, you're not tithing enough. Now, I'm not going to go so far as to say that, but he was, he was touching on a very important point. This is an act of faith, and it should feel like an act of faith every time that you do it. I'm trusting that God has taken care of me this long. I express my gratitude generously um, and to, to, in order to keep the flow going. I remember at a certain point when Swamiji was teaching us about money and we were all getting a little nervous about tithing because we seemed to be a little bit short of money. I remember thinking at the time, well, this is precisely the time when you have to keep tithing because if your finances get low and you stop because you can't afford it, that's the last time that you want to break the flow of energy. And I have no way of quantifying this. I don't have a control group. I don't have statistics or anything like that. But I personally feel that consistent tithing is the secret of, of a happy, prosperous life. Um, one of the very important secrets that we just consistently, without hesitation, and I mean, even just this week when I was writing a tithing check, you know, just for a second I thought, ooh, you know, there it is. I have to give all that money, take that money out of my own checkbook. And then I thought, oh, Asha, can, I can't believe even in this moment that you're still even questioning it. So I, of course, mastered even that moments of hesitation and gave it joyfully. Now, technically, you can tithe whatever percent you want. You know, if 10% is just more than you can go, just lower the number. But try to do it as a percentage. Try to take the decision out of your hand so that you don't have to ask every single time, can I afford it? Do I want it? None of that. Just, this isn't mine. This isn't mine. It just goes over to the other side. Experiment with it. It's really a great happy thing. Now, people ask questions. Do I tithe off the net or do I tithe off the gross? <laughs> do I pay all my bills and then tithe from what's left? Do I tithe first? as the first bill that I pay. And I, I don't have any rules. You should do what feels just, just a little bigger than what you're comfortable with, but not so much bigger that you are not able to do it. That's really what's important. And if everybody in the world tithed to the source of their inspiration, we'd live on a very different planet than we live on now. You know, I should also add, I'm, some people I know tithe like to the Sierra Club or to something else that inspires them. If they're not uh, spiritually inclined, 
but they want to support that which inspires them, a source of inspiration to them. So think about it. But it can't become too personal and too personality oriented. It should be as close as possible to giving it to God. But you can't really write a check to God. And, or, or as uh, I heard it spoken, someone said, oh yes, I, I give to God a portion of everything that I earn. I just take whatever I've earned, I throw it up in the air, and I ask God to take what he wants and whatever falls back to earth I keep. <laughs> so you can't do something that's really just playing with your mind and tricking the system. Okay, my friends, that's the end of... But and then Swamiji also says here, it's not a requirement. It's that if it isn't... If generosity is not expressed with the whole heart as a spontaneous sincere expression of gratitude, then it's better just to keep the money. You get a little bit of good karma from forcing, from doing it as a rote exercise. But what, what we're really trying to do, the Ananda way of life, is not to look good. The Ananda way of life is to, is to be good inside yourself. So that's what you're working toward. So that is Article 9 about money. Article 10 is about home building. Now this is exceedingly specific to Ananda village, so I'll read it through, but it's, it, uh, it goes into areas that are too exact to be uh, applicable to anyone. Homes are built or remodeled in cooperation with the appropriate community leaders who oversee the harmonious outward development of the community. This rule is important both because of the fact that individual homes need to be treated as integral to their surroundings and because other members at some later date may be required to live in them. For instance, should the present resident be transferred to another Ananda community, or now we've been there long enough because the, the other Ananda community the person will be transferred to might be in the astral world, so their home in Ananda village won't be of any value to them anymore. <laughs> a basic consideration in the building of a home is that thought be given to expressing architecturally some aspect of the ideals of crystal clarity as expressed in the book Cities of Light, A Place, A Plan for This Age, and also the book um, Space, Light, and Harmony which is a beautiful book that Swamiji wrote about the building of what has become Crystal Hermitage, which started out as his single dome and is now um, a rather expansive community center. So some, some good ideas about architecture are contained in both of those books, especially Space, Light, and Harmony. And also that book really talks about just thinking about how the environment exp uh, ex it, uh, how the vir environment affects our consciousness and what we can do to cooperate with that. You know, there's a, an aspect of, of the, the building of the community at Ananda Village, which is that one of the things that uh, that, that community has really had to um, explore, they've been on the frontier of it, which is let me think for a moment, no other Ananda community Well, there was it has really had to work with this to the same extent because Ananda village was bare land and everything that almost, well, not completely bare, there was a few old buildings on it, but everything that's been put there has been put there deliberately by us. Um, here where I live in Palo Alto and all the urban communities, we simply took over an existing apartment complex so we've had no input on the architecture or the decision-making. Unfortunately, it's functional architecture, but not imaginative in any of our communities. But at Ananda Village, they had the opportunity to build from the ground up. Unfortunately, not everything we did at the beginning was as well thought out as it might have been. So Ami Kriyananda had the, had the experience, which none of the rest of us had, in that first decade or so, which is that he grew up in Europe and traveled extensively all around the world. And he had a very clear idea of what could be created in terms of creating something that looked and felt like a village, 
and you know a certain uni uniformity of building materials and of design and and he could see it most of us had had never traveled at that point now of course we've all been many of us have been in many places of the world and have seen these charming villages in Switzerland or in Italy or in even in uh places that are perhaps less prosperous but nonetheless out of necessity have all built in the same architecture even with very simple materials and how completely charming and community like that can be but in america especially people are proud of the expression my home is my castle and in the original years um founding years part of what drew some people to the that the place um they were there for master and they were there for spiritual reasons but also they were going to build their own home owner built houses was like part of the clarion cry for my my generation where we were repudiating the way society was operating and um that movement also drove people to ananda even though we all discovered those of us who stayed that we were really there for a different purpose but that thought form my home my castle i get to do it my way was not always wholesome for the development of the community it was not always wholesome for the individuals involved asserting that point of view but swami's vision was just a little bigger than the majority of us could see we did build a uh, geodesic domes Swami ji was able to get that thought across. They proved a little bit to be a somewhat impractical design because it was essentially one big room. So that gradually had to be modified and a lot of them burned down in 1976, although quite a few were rebuilt after that. But nonetheless this uh, excessive assertion of independence which is not entirely consistent as i've repeated many times in this entirely consistent with the idea of a community um inter made impossible the the caring forth of the idea that swami ji had of how ananda would be built swami ji was a very wise leader and he knew when victory was not possible and a gracious retreat was appropriate so although he made consistent efforts in the first 10 15 years to try to have us build the community in such a way that we would really end up with with a real community when we were done community architecture a community appearance that would also be charming and not merely uniform but also would have us would in and of itself make a statement about our consciousness and what we were doing that's what swami was trying to do to have to follow master's principle of immortalizing our ideals in architecture but it didn't quite happen like that and uh at the at the end swami said well what we can do now is plant a lot of trees <laughs> because it just it 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 couldn't come to be So he wrote the book Space Light and Harmony and he wrote Cities of Light um because he said when when a leader is unable to inspire people to follow his his lead in and to to be in tune with some idea that he's trying to put across he said on the leader's part it's it's either a failure of communication or or a failure of being able to um unify people's consciousness the problem is either in communication or in consciousness and the practical thing for the leader to do is to work to improve communication and to raise consciousness so swami wrote two books you know trying to plant the ideas in the ether in the hope that over time um the the vision that he was seeing if it's intended by the divine if it's the appropriate vision that many others will see it and then it will be able to manifest so my friends god bless you